Good evening. It is Friday, April 3rd, 2020, and it is 6 p.m. in the capital of the United States of America, Washington, D.C., and you are tuned to The Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, political scientist, author, and nationally syndicated columnist, Dr. Wilmer Leon. For the next hour, we will explore and analyze the salient news stories that are impacting the global village in which we live. Well, it's Friday, so we'll kick off today's show the same way we do every Friday with my first guest. He's a frequent collaborator with all major news outlets and author of City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, Caleb Moppin. Caleb, as always, welcome back. Glad to be here, as always. So earlier this week, the White House reshared data publicly that the president had used privately in recent days about how many Americans they expected to die of the novel coronavirus. The estimate between 100,000 to 240,000 deaths over the next few months. Now it's being reported that the experts whose research the White House used said they don't challenge the numbers validity, but they don't know how the White House arrived at them. They have not provided the underlying data so others can assess its reliability or provide long-term strategies to lower that death count. Your thoughts in the context of, in 2018, the president canceled the pandemic office within the government and has now put his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, in that position to perform perform that function or some semblance thereof? You know, this points to a very serious problem, and it shouldn't be that complicated to explain. But in a national emergency like this, uh, at this point, we really need to be able to feel like we can trust what our politicians and our leaders and those responsible for our safety and for public health are saying. If they are not giving us proper instruction, proper warning, proper, proper indications of what we should do, how are we supposed to do it? And the repeated pattern of the Trump White House and Trump himself getting up and saying things that are not accurate uh, is deeply, deeply disturbing. Now, I'm not the only American who feels that way. That's a pretty widespread sentiment at this point. But it ties into a bigger problem. Because I will notice that I have seen on social media a number of people attempting to claim that this whole coronavirus situation is a hoax, it's fake, and that just boggles my mind. How can they be saying this? But then again, I've realized something, that our politicians and our leaders for the last decade and a half have been basically doing what I call a light switch effect. When there's a news story that breaks out, you have two choices. You can either believe exactly what the Pentagon and what the government wants you to believe, or you can go into crazy land. That's how it's framed up. If you say, well, hey, are we sure Assad, Assad, you know, gassed his own people? Is that what all the weapons inspectors are saying? And they just roll their eyes. Oh, there you go. You're with Alex Jones, UFOs, Illuminati, right? If you say, hey, are you sure Russia, Russia rigged the elections for Trump? I'm not sure the evidence is there. They say, oh boy, oh boy, I bet space aliens bombed the World Trade Center. And they create this light switch effect where you have to believe whatever they say or else you're in la-la land. You're, you're considered to be a lunatic and, and you're in this conspiracy land where everything is a false flag. Well, the reality is that our politicians have lied. They have said things that are inaccurate. They have misled the public. And as a result of that, when people realize it, they have no choice. There is no gray area. There's no room for debate or discussion. So they're forced to go into this crazy world. And you'll notice now, that after any big event happens in the United States, whether it's a mass shooting, uh, whether it's uh, you know a, a train wreck or a plane crash, immediately the Internet is full of videos saying that it's a false flag, this is the government staging it, blah, blah, blah. And this is a result of their actions. By painting legitimate questions and legitimate foreign policy discourse and legitimate concerns and reporters and journalists who ask legitimate questions, as lunatics, as conspiracy nuts, they have basically created a big audience for lunatics and conspiracy nuts. They've created a public that can't tell the difference between asking legitimate questions and you know, claiming that things like coronavirus are a hoax. I'm here in New York City, 
Coronavirus is not a hoax. And if there's ever been a moment where we need to trust our government officials and be able to believe what they are saying, it's now. And I am just outraged, outraged uh, by what they have done with their light switch effect, with their with their uh, marginalization of alternative narratives and alternative media. They've created a situation where millions of Americans would actually think, I don't know millions, but many Americans on social media apparently are under the delusion that this coronavirus situation isn't real. It's very real, folks. It's very, very real. I hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you. And it takes me to looking at this another way. And this hit me about four o'clock this morning, and this will be a, a bit long, but bear with me. We have this pandemic. The world just passed 1 million COVID-19 infections and the U.S. topped 1,000 coronavirus deaths in a single day for the first time this past Wednesday. It's wreaking havoc on the global economy. Record 6.6 million Americans sought unemployment benefits last week. As if this is not enough, the U.S. decides to weaponize aid and sanction countries such as Venezuela and Iran, who are seeking PPE and medicine to deal with this pandemic. Israel has weaponized COVID-19 as another oppressive tool against the Palestinians, and the Saudis have weaponized the virus against the Yemenis in Hodeidah. Saudi warplanes bombed a quarantine center that had been prepared to treat coronavirus patients. The Navy removes an aircraft carrier captain who raised alarm about the coronavirus response. It's a medical pandemic and the politics are killing people. Caleb Moppin. Well, let's speak strictly from a legal standpoint. To attack a medical facility is a war crime. It is a violation of international law, plain and simple. Uh, You know, when, when I was on a boat headed to Hodeida in Yemen with the Red Crescent Society and the Red Cross, trying to deliver humanitarian aid, and the Saudis made it impossible for us to deliver our humanitarian aid by bombing the port and killing medical students at the university and such. That was a violation of, of international law. That was a crime against humanity. And what Mike Pompeo is doing, escalating the sanctions against Venezuela and Iran at a time like this, making it even more of a humanitarian catastrophe, preventing needed medicine from arriving in those countries, That's a crime. And the decision to label Maduro a narco drug trafficker and and send an armada of ships to to harass Venezuela, again, this is all hugely contrary to basic international law, right? It's one thing to engage in war when countries are at war with each other. It's another thing to prevent people that are sick, that are civilians, from getting medical attention. And The fact that there is not a huge amount of international outrage about this is certainly disturbing because this is the very definition of a violation of international law. If you are if you are preventing those in need of medical assistance from getting the medical assistance they need, you're a war criminal. Nuremberg standards, you're a war criminal. You've got European leaders warning that the coronavirus uh, could lead to the breakup of the EU. Looking at Border restrictions that have been reimposed. Germany and France have uh, thrown up export bans on medical equipment. There are those who are saying, leaders in Europe, that are saying that this could cause bigger problems for the EU, particularly coming on the heels of the Brexit vote. That sounds about right. I mean, you know, there's already fear of of immigrants in Europe. There's already a feeling that the European community is not working in the interests of all the countries that participate. And I feel like in a situation like this, those feelings are going to escalate. And it is very likely that this could be the end of the European Union. Brexit uh, was just the beginning. But we don't know that for a fact. It may be that countries throughout Europe, let's remember, Europe isn't just France and Germany. It's also countries, countries like Hungary, you know, uh, countries like Romania. And countries like that, you know, are very poor and they need help. Um, and, and handling this all on their own is something they're probably not prepared to do. So it may end up uh, that, that, that some countries will cling to the European Union at a time like this. But I can see why in the wealthier countries uh, there would be more feelings of, of uh, anti-European and Euroskeptical sentiment. Are you concerned about the idea of martial law being imposed here? We have, again, we had 3.3 million people declaring unemployment two weeks ago. We had 6.6 
million declaring uh, unemployment last week. There are talks that we could lose by the time this is done, up to 20 million jobs could be lost. That's not the fertile ground for happy and content public. Your thoughts on a fear or concern of martial law or something very close to that being declared, is is that the talk of the canary in the coal mine or is that Chicken Little claiming that the sky is falling? You know, when someone's being very irresponsible, they tend to make one mistake first and then panic and see the results of their mistake and then make the opposite mistake, right? That tends to be when people are very inexperienced and don't know what they're doing, that tends to be the pattern. They lean one way too far. Oh boy, I leaned this way too far. Then they lean the other way too far. And it seems like right now in New York City, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, so many people were in total violation of of the health department regulations, crowding into restaurants, crowding into bars, you know, even last week in my neighborhood, I, I looked out the window and I saw people playing basketball, five, seven, eight, nine, ten people, which specifically was said by Governor Cuomo that you should not do, and that there was a loose enforcement at first. And we know that there was a fear, right, of the economic impact, and there was a feeling, let's try not to shut down New York too much because we don't want the economic impact to be too bad. And my fear is that because this was handled too loosely and was not taken seriously enough, and there wasn't enough of an enforcement, that when things get bad, if they continue, if we don't get control of this pretty soon, we could have a really over-the-top enforcement, a very dangerous over-the-top enforcement to make up for the lack of enforcement we had at the beginning. I mean, they should have shut down bars and restaurants from day one. They should have enforced uh, this no-gathering rule. I mean, there's many things that should have been done. This wasn't really taken seriously, especially here in New York at the beginning. At the beginning, there was very much a nonchalant attitude, probably based in the desire that we need to keep the economy going. And my gotcha. fear is that, that, that we could go over the top and that there could be a very dangerous uh, crackdown in the aftermath of, of the mistakes that were made at first. Um, and I hope that's not the case. I hope we can get control of things before things escalate to that point. I have seen reports about looting in different parts of the country, and I've heard about gun sales going through the roof. I mean, this is a Correct. powder keg. We're sitting on a powder keg here. Caleb Moppin, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly appreciate your contribution to the Critical Hour. Please uh, stay healthy and look forward to having you back. Sure thing. Always a pleasure. All right, folks, you're listening to the Critical Hour here on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, Dr. Wilmer Leon. There is more on the other side, so please stay tuned. 